So first of all, my name is Nia McAllister and I am the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora. And as we gather here, it is essential to acknowledge the times we're living in and the circumstances we're still navigating. Moed affirms Black Lives Matter and recognizes and condemns white supremacy and the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tony McDade, Casey Goodson Jr., Patrick Warren Sr., Andre Hill, Dante Wright, Anthony Thompson Jr., Micaiah Bryant, and so many others who have lost their lives in police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that Moab's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say these names, to hold space, and to honor these victims. I also want to acknowledge the physical spaces that we're occupying. Though we're gathered virtually, many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent. And our institutions were founded on the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we're located. It is with deep respect that Maad acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people and our network servers are all on unceded native lands. And we would like to thank the indigenous peoples of the Bay Area and beyond who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And we encourage everyone to learn more about the native lands that you occupy by visiting nativeland.ca. And I wanna thank everyone for being here in this space, for gathering with us to spend an evening of poetry and storytelling together. I'm always grateful to find community and healing through art. And so this is a space for us to recognize all of our feelings, our anger, exhaustion, grief, um, and also to find comfort in each other's company. And so I wanna emphasize that in this space, we, we center respect. Uh, we continue to create spaces that amplify black voices um, and celebrate our creativity. So for people new um, to this space and those returning, I'll just give a brief overview of the logistics of the event. Um, so we'll begin our first half of the event uh, with our first open mic readers. And about midway through, we will have our featured poet, which tonight is Ali Jones. And I'm so excited to have Ali here tonight. And following Ali's feature, we'll close out with our remaining open mic readers. So each reader has about four minutes to share and I will read out uh, the, the reader's names in advance. If for some reason someone isn't in the space when I call their name, we'll circle back if they join us later on. And I'll drop the full lineup in the chat in just a moment as well. And I ask that all the folks in the audience, um, while we, I ask you to keep your, your microphones on mute throughout the event, I do encourage affirmations. So please use the reactions, use air hands and claps, um, use the chat as well, call out words and phrases that stand out to you and really show love and support to all the people sharing tonight. So I think those are all the logistics. <laughs> And with that, I would like to invite Norm Maddox up to the mic to start us off. Welcome, Norm. Hi, good afternoon over there. Good evening over here. Um, this piece is uh, a little bit different than what I normally read. As a matter of fact, this is coming from a time when I was uh, working in the classroom. And uh, then I'll follow up with uh, another piece. Working from inside the belly of this beast, this education system, this judicial system, this police state demands that this black human resource follow the menu of strategies and practices that will teach the babies that they must learn how to stay in their seat, to learn how to follow rules without asking questions. Get it? Don't get it. The it doesn't matter. Relevance is not the concern. Understanding is not the purpose. Conform to know your place is in between failing and doing poorly. 
the success of the black and brown student is the failure of the system. This other piece is titled, Dear Heart. And it's been a few months since I read this on Moed before. It's been a while I haven't spoken with you. I explore you from a distance. When I look at you, I feel I am arriving to a shore with no footprints. Makes me wonder, is there no one here before me? I discover you for the last time. I see you remember, you remember love as if she died yesterday. The doctor asked you to sign the DNR on a clipboard at the foot of the stairs. I hear the argument between you and the ancestors. Love is immutable, my brother. It will always be love. Even at the end, when the last kiss sheds flesh, stains lips like a tattoo. Remember when love was coming home, hugs and slow breaths that calmed your agitated heart. Remember, love never dies because of death. Love lives in every shared rumble of the heart every paused silence, like waves rolling over waves to lay at your feet. Love lives in every dream, every memory soaked with wordless light, shining from the inside out. Flightless birds tempted to bloom in your heart, a nest. Peace. Wow, thank you so much, Norm. That last piece was absolutely beautiful. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. Next up, I would like to invite Sarai Bordeaux up to the mic. Welcome, Sarai. Hi, everybody. Um, I have two pieces today. One, I just wrote in a workshop that I was in with Adrian earlier. Whoop, whoop, shout out to you. Um, and the other one, I'm going to read the other part of the contrapuntal. I read it down last time. I'm going to read it across this time. Other, I'll do those two. <clears throat> um, and this was a, the first one is based off of a free write. And the prompt was um, what I would like to mend with my grandmother's hands. In my family, the women have carried many things, both loudly and silently empowered and disallowed. The women have picked battles, lost and won them, not on their own behalf, but for that of our line. Our fears hidden under her hem, worked out in our dreams at night, her nightmares during the day. I can't say how much our women stole back, how much our grandmothers stole us back from the arms of this place, how much our women gave unbeknownst. From my grandmother's hands, I hope to mend our suffering in secret, mend the worry, mend the hoard of things and feelings that protect her and therefore us. Minds mends us during the time that no was not an option. I would like to mend the sacrifice of her very core, the giving of her joy to everyone except herself, the reflection, the care of everyone except herself, the distillation of dissonance she swallowed for our safety. From her hands, because of her, we can even fathom softness. She had to be hard or put up so that we could now make the choice to remove ourselves voluntarily, say no, be heard in that no and left alone. From her hands, our true freedom, our liberation is an option. And the second one um, is called Within Freedom. Within freedom, 
we have the time to go slow. I am first and foremost mine. I get to think myself all the way through. My needs are spent my needs are met without spending money all of the time or losing my mind. We enjoy each other's complexities. The money I do spend stays with us. We are also rich in time. Within the community we've built, the meaning of life is different. We celebrate each other's gifts and talents. We have been here all along. We protect each other's vulnerabilities and uncovered our truest selves. We argue, but not to cut deep. We are different, but we need each other just the same. We shoot together. We hear, heal our ancestors in this. Our bullets never fly over nothing. Our elders taught us this. Our knives do not know each other's blood in most part. The future kin depends on this. We hold fast in freedom. We carry on. Each moment contains our past and our futures. We ride together, interbeing, interacting. In this, we remain present, not for each other's bullshit, not as a rejection. We check that, we know that. In acceptance, it's okay for us to disagree. We have made it this far till now, expanding in complexity. Right now in freedom, this is not a wheels fall off situation. I unravel these truths, checked the wheels, checked them against myself before we left with Bruce's perception of what I am doing. Communication is how I'm allowed to do now. Doing it now, boundaries help me take steps to make this freedom my consciousness with intimacy, my reality. I need more intimacy in my freedom more than in the moments I steal away. Some of us will not be there in the stealing away. This is freedom too. And we are okay with that. Everything I think freedom is, is a healing. This is where the blood on our knives comes in, just that. We have to protect our young in these poems too. The young ones within ourselves too. These poems are maps and blueprints too. They help us stay together. I can get free as long as we all can. In spirit, as long as I spill off the page on blocks we own, as long as this process leads to land we share, leads to being about that action, space we steward, taking that action. We retreat in the spaces we are stealing to heal and travel. We are taking our freedom with one another, taking our power to our understanding of vacations are changing, turning into power that turns these wildest dreams work has changed in my mind. I use my voice differently until there aren't moments or escape dreams anymore. We still dream and speak just as loudly sometimes until, the, until in freedom I am first mine. And sometimes when we need not speak at all, my needs are met without having to spend. We flow within each other's unspoken languages on a dime. Our body minds connected within freedom. I get to keep my body and my mind. Thank you for listening. Wow, those were amazing, Sarai. It's so fun getting to hear that piece that you read last time, um, but read in the different direction. So thank you so much for bringing that back for all of us. Next up, I would like to invite Shauna Sherman up to the mic. Welcome, Shauna. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Is my audio okay? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, 
so I'm a new poet and I'm trying to read the American canon, but as I read the canon, you know, every once in a while, there's a line that sort of makes you go, hmm. So this first poem is based on that. It's called Confused Over Curlicues After Robert Lowell. Please define curlicues of marijuana. Is it the C3 structure in the shaft? Is it the white swirling smoke of the joint? Or is it the way you say, Frank, it looks like I put my finger in the socket? Is it the bounce when I pat it or when a bit of paper collides? Really, what I'm trying to understand is how the Negro and the marijuana got associated with hair. Is it because you went to the ghetto to get the good stuff and stopped at the pizza shop? Is it because you learned of Pacalolo at the jazz club at small festivals of love? I bet the man in the tank you call boy wanted to be a CEO but ran out of money. How about we call the marijuana a white prick shrinking when lit? In the tranquilized 50s, you understand, the role was white. You know, bra not being trendy until the early 2000s. So please let me know how you came up with the black man with curly cues of marijuana in his hair, because I'm beginning to smell the overpowering stale aroma of that one line and can't remember the rest of your poem. Uh, the next one is called Accommodationist No More. From green pastures, I gaze at memories leading the way measured by the redwood tree in the land of giants. The direction finder points angle 88 degrees. I'm a statue with wings, utility pole, evergreen needle. I persist in mist and wind with achromatic insects. I wonder at the tongue of the moth as it sucks nectar from the wild orchid nearby, then flits to the orchid up high in the canopy. Patch me to this swirling existence, woman, goddess, fighter, truth teller, accommodationist, no more. Here fireworks burst, blue light flash in the distance. Thank you all. Thank you, Sana. That was wonderful. Next up, I would like to invite Milani Clay up to the mic. Welcome. Okay. Hello. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome. This is what happens when you're using unfamiliar technology. Okay. Um, I am going to share this poem titled, Everything is a Gun Except a Gun. Okay. A bullet is a bouquet until it's aimed at a black body. Same way a machete can be a butter knife, a rifle, a balloon animal, squeaky clean, depravity, a mental illness. Same way a bullet entering a chamber can be a prayer with a white man behind it. Every question from a black mouth becomes an assault, refusal to comply with our death sentence, forever being sentenced to death, forever caught between capital and murder, a wallet is a gun, a stereo is a gun, slick tongue gun, psychosis gun, turn back gun, loud voice gun, sweat gun, everything is a gun except a gun when it is in white hands. Then it is taser, it is shield, it is impunity, it is stiff breeze blown across the fragile sands of a human life, rendering it an echo buried in the graves. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that piece. So there's a couple of folks that I'm gonna circle back to in the second half. Um, but for now, I'm going to read a couple poems. I'm just pulling them up. <laughs> so the first one that I'm gonna share is entitled To a Body Returning Home. 
We have come a long way, haven't we? We wear the scars of change. They look nice, don't they? We say that now, now that growth dresses herself these days. We have so much to be proud of. We remember all those who have come before us so that we can be here today in this beautiful, in this strong, in this changing body. We will birth futures in this body. We carry the tools for our revival. We must know how to protect ourselves first. We will find joy, we will find pain, we will find challenge, we will find triumph in this skin. We are both safe and unsafe. We are both feared and fearful. We do not have to choose one state of being. We claim all that we want for ourselves. We are on our way back. We are our first home. We are home. And this next piece that I'm going to read is actually a, a, an original version of a poem that I think I've shared in this space before. So this is uh, an iteration before it became the poem that you may recognize. And so this is called, So You Find Me Bleeding Stories. The only time the ocean cut me, I bled stories. They said, what a beautiful yet terrifying thing it is to be free. They said, we have traveled years to bring you our names because we knew you'd forget them or worse, never recognize them in the first place. They said, do you remember how we backtracked border crossed across lands that never made territory of its own skin to begin with. They said, we paper trailed our way here across unwanted walls, swallowed our tongues, folded our memories, all to breathe on the same side as our ancestors took their last. They said, it is not that we must leave you it is what we pass on to you that matters. So we write, we dance, we rename our story legacy before they claim we were never here in the first place. We body map memory, tuck away trauma, hold fast to tradition and sow our nourishment into the so soil. Because as the stories say, we have always been our first home. Thank you. So definitely an unintentional theme uh, with both of those poems, <laughs> but hey, we're finding home. And with that, I am so honored to introduce our featured poet for this evening, Ali Jones. Ali is a self-care advocate, writer, artist, and Creole mermaid, currently pursuing a master's in creative writing and literature at Mills College. She is the director and co-founder of Black Freighter Press, a revolutionary press committed to the exploration of liberation using art to transform consciousness. Ali's podcast called Chit, Chit Chat with Ali Cat explores self-care practices and journeys of self-love in community. Welcome, Ali. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. My gosh, this has been so beautiful. Um, and Nia, I love that piece. I was like, yes, <laughs> screaming. Um, yeah, just coming back home, like I, I, that resonates with everything. Holla, yes, back, back, back. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm not gonna cry before we start. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say first. Um, I actually want us to just begin like in breath um, and in honor really. Uh, of Nia Wilson. Uh, today is the anniversary of her murder. And so I just want us to hold space for her, for our breathing um, and for her family, you know? Uh, so I'm gonna just invite everyone to take three deep breaths. Um, and on that last third one, just let whatever you need to out. 
you're muted, so you're good. No one can hear you. Uh, take a deep breath in, just filling up your lungs. Let it out. Another deep breath in. Notice what you can let go of this time. And let it out. On this last one, like I said, we're going to make it audible. going to just let it go, whatever you need to. Take a deep breath in. Let it out. <sighs> cool. Take out whatever you need to there. Whew. Gonna get into some some writing. So I am gonna share some poetry, but I'm also gonna share some prose. As Nia said, I'm a student at Mills and I'm studying creative writing uh, with an emphasis on prose. I'm writing a YA novel. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm really excited about that. So I'm going to share a bit of that and some of my poetry, um, just letting folks know some of it will be in English, Spanish, French. Um, some pieces I'll, I'll interpret, but I, I don't really do it for all of them. So just letting you know. Whew, we're going to get into it. Sweet potato lies. A lie that no one in my family actually believed. It was a lie crafted over the years. Daughters were safe, mothers were calm, uncles and fathers were protectors. The lie that decomposed everything and ate away at my family like maggots at a grave site. The facade multiplied with each second. Manufactured memories that bled and drank to forget, ate to erase remnants, fragments, a jar of jambalaya. She was the definition of organized chaos. My mom was also known as Thule, but to everyone but Nana and on tax forms. Tallulah Jackson, nay Tallulah Rose LaRue, named after her grandmother and Nana G's favorite flower. I loved her name. Whenever she would initial my agenda for school, I'd make Carson Daly jokes she never understood. She worked the graveyard shift at a toll bridge, and during the day she was a Renaissance woman, writer, painter, actress, who went into hibernation more often than bears. Shaka Khan and Rufus would blare behind closed doors to her office. When she was in the zone, there was no creative stone that went unturned. I always admired that about her. She never let anything or anyone get in her way. A rejection was just a suggestion for a new direction. Over the past few months, this wasn't the case. She had been in the same tan robe and black furry slippers for weeks. An assortment of her paints were in one corner on a pile, scripts stacked in another, props flung on her burgundy velvet couch. She had so many hats. Every color, fabric, and pattern. When we were younger, she would read us stories on that burgundy couch. We were spoiled with three bedtime stories, one in her office, one in the bathtub, and one when she tucked us in. I would pick a new hat each night. And on our adventure, I would just choose what we would do. Church hats, berets, beanies, and a cowboy hat. It was grandpa's and it was always off limits. I was Captain Ave, Princess Ave, a French artist or one of the ladies from Nana's church, reading on my own by the time I was three. And most nights, I loved to tell her the third story, adding elaborate twists and tales as she wrote them down. I was a princess who was an award-winning inventor, a loud sea captain seeking an underwater kingdom, and a prolific psychic artist painting the unseen. But nosy church lady was her favorite. She would light up like there was a sale at Macy's. And I thought it was her favorite because of how creative I was. But it was because of how close I was to Nana's accent. If she had a favorite parent, it was grandpa. He died when I was too young to really remember much about him. That was when laughter left her body and she replaced it with his favorite beer. I miss that version of her before he passed, lighthearted, caring, happy. The opposite of the person I know today, overwhelmed, overbooked, and exhausted. 
Okay, so that's that first part. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this novel is really exploring family, um, ancestry, and in kind of a mythical, magical way. Uh, it turns, there's some twists and turns that come. Um, and, and really, I was inspired by a lot of things. Um, I spent a lot of time by the, like, just by the water. I'm like, literally, I, I feel like I'm a water person. <laughs> I'm like, yes, mermaids. Um, and I really just wanted to explore, like, what does it mean to hold space for yourself, to grow in spaces that don't always do that? Um, and, and how do you adapt, right? Like, what does resilience look like? And I've, I've seen that in so many ways. So uh, we're gonna get into the poetry. This piece is called Siren Rising. I don't wanna remember my life before mermaids. I was raised by saltwater queens, blessed by magical beings of mythic proportions, daughters of Yemeya and Gumbo, those who remind me of the beautiful resilience that lives within us. Coiled crowns adorned with cowrie, goddesses who maintain the grace of a gazelle with the ever-changing tides. May Sigan, my mermaid queens, flowing, crashing, rising. My grandma Genevieve. Cayenne pepper royalty, celestial matriarch, soft, yet steady as a metronome in the kitchen with a laugh that could brighten any dim room. Unafraid of what is to come because her certainty is founded in love. Her setbacks created the beginning of her greatest comebacks, flowing through the roughest currents and remaining strong, flowing, crashing, rising. Mother Teresa, Calming like rosemary and gentle as gardenias, earth warrior who taught me to respect and protect the earth, to value all forms of life. Holding space for her softness and her offspring, unconditionally magical, conjuring potions that transform the flu into a slight sniffle, or inventing the perfect bedtime story she grew in the midst of adversity. Never allowing fear to stop her pursuit, crashing against every judgment or expectation with determination, flowing, crashing, rising. May see him, my mermaid queens. Cousins who always remind me that I could do anything. Sisters who challenge me to seek softness in times of pain and trauma, to look at myself in a mirror untarnished by self-loathing. My aquatic angels who kept me sane when all I thought I could ever be was crazy. Loving with their hearts wide open, guided by our gut feelings and our star signs. Revo, croyant, amant, et guerrier. Dreamers, believers, lovers, and warriors. Rising above black holes of doubt, insecurities, and fear. Flowing, crashing, rising. Woo! Breathing, y'all. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, Okay, so before I do this next one, I just wanna talk about something for a little bit and share some stuff um, because I, I think about the spaces, the people and communities that have nourished me and, and how we have to show up for each other, right? And how important it is to do that. Um, next Thursday, we will be uh, in front of Eastside Arts Alliance with Beloved and Insistence. I just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, we need volunteers, we need plants, we need all kinds of things. We will be building community garden altars um, for the beloved on East 14th. Uh, and it, it's just going to be a really beautiful space. Um, Mama Regina Evans called me and was like, Ali, I wanna do this thing. And this is my vision. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. And we have been doing this since last summer. We've been providing PPE, hand sanitizer, masks, condoms, um, just visual love, art, affirmations, you know, posters. Um, I remember I was in a workshop and Melani has her image on 
when her face isn't on. And it's one of the posters that I made for Beloved. And I'll never forget because, whew, okay, y'all, I'm like a cry, I'm a crier. Um, I'll never forget, I was in that workshop and I was having like a really tough day. And Milani came in and I was like already excited because I was like, yes. But then I saw the picture and I was like, okay, all right. You know, you have those moments and the poster said, you are loved, period. You know, and I, I just want to remind us all, if y'all are in Oakland or nearby, come through. If you're not and you are able to donate, we have an Amazon wish list. Go, go grab some things. We've been sorting all of our donations this week. And, and it's just really beautiful to see how people have been showing up, even if they're like, far away they're like we support this work um and it's it's really important you know like the youth who are are out there they see it they know that we're there for them and and it's not it's not about people's ego it's not about a savior complex it's just so we so we're not turning a blind eye right like and mama regina always says like they're everybody's babies it's not about it's not about like, oh, that's not my family. That's not my child. That's not, that's not how we're moving. So please come out if you are in the area. Um, and like I said, if you're not, if you know people, just share, just share as, as much as you, as you can. Um, Cause it's, it's really important and it's going to be really beautiful. Okay. Nana loved to tell stories. I'm positive there was a long story behind this unspoken feud between her and mom. I remember Nana talking about how hard it was for them when they first moved to California from Louisiana. Grandpa was a sailor, stationed nearby at a Navy base, and they had four little mouths to feed and clothe. In all of the old pictures I saw, they were always dressed to the nines, matching bows, department store dresses, and perfectly coiffed hair. No matter how much money they did or didn't have, they got by. Nothing ever happened with me and that girl. Why you ask? Nanji said. I just noticed y'all never smile or laugh when you're together. We ain't got a giggle to get along. Nanji said. She laughed at herself and said, Do get yours in many feet, eh? Toujours, Nana. Toujours, I said. She didn't want to talk about it anymore. I received her signal loud and clear. I didn't think we were going to stay for her as long as we did, but she was glad to have us. I was going to have to use a different strategy for information. She went back to pulling the weeds from her garden, and I picked the rake back up. Maybe a little deception. Nothing treacherous, just some white lies. Our family's specialty. My mom told me about what happened. She said you two fell out. Say what now? She told me that our family's built on lies. I said, well, I'll be. I had to keep a straight face. Nana knew all, and I, I wasn't going to have her catching me in this fabricated truth. I had to act quickly. She thought she'd never forgive you, but things changed. I had work. Never meant anything to happen to Lula and him, she said. I always thought our memories were made of molasses. Sticky and sweet, syrup, concoction, light, dark, black, strap, entrapment. I envision a cavern full of souvenirs concentrated and crystallized, a space where our most sacred experiences lived on a shelf in a colorful glass bottle. I watched my grandmother's face shift and drift into her memories, waves of conflict. The only time I'd ever seen her tear, shed a tear was when she was cooking onions or at Grandpa Walter's funeral. I saw water swell in her eyes, sea salt streams, the only family they had here was her older sister, her husband, and their three sons. From a family of 14 siblings, I could tell it was hard. Harder than anyone would ever let on. Nana looked all over the kitchen for a sugar container, the canary yellow one that she always kept right next to the stove. It was in the same spot my entire life. Nothing changed but her memory. Recollection extracted like sugar gradually. Whatever I said, I wanted to take it back, all of it. 
Um, yeah, so just a little background. I spent a lot of time with my grandma growing up in her kitchen, um, in her garden. Uh, and those two places were always interchangeable. We would go from the kitchen to the garden and vice versa, uh, whatever we were making. And uh, I just learned so much about who I could be with, you know, like nourishment, right? Like when you think about like watching something grow, cooking something like, like patience, I'm working on the patience y'all, but you know, <laughs> like really having the space to be able to, to cultivate. Uh, and so this next piece, I wrote it uh, seven days before she passed away. And, and it still kind of mystifies me because I was like, I, this was literally a week before, I don't know. And I've gone back to it and I've, I've read it a few times since. And it's just like such a beautiful like love letter to her. Uh, and so here we go. It's called Genevieve. La plupart de ma cœur, elle est, elle était, elle est toujours la plupart de ma vie, ma cœur, me. I'm grateful for my grandma Genevieve, a daughter of Louisiana sharecroppers, no middle name, several last names, five daughters, one in heaven, lost in a trance, ready to dance, the best cook in our family. She was young, wild, and free before it was a thing to be. Dedicated to her family, laughing uncontrollably, cleaning houses every day, 40 years just to make a way for us. No limits to her love, she drew energy from above. So below we were able to grow, flow, go. She taught me to appreciate everything, never about cars or bling, garden plots and recipes, the very best of me. She taught me how to love, feel, and heal. There will never be another quite like my mother's mother. There will never be enough words dans tous les langues to describe her magnanimous presence, the essence of love and light. We will be all right. Even on the darkest days, she found a way. I was there the day her life changed. All of her plans rearranged on the bedroom floor. La plupart de ma cœur, elle est, elle était, elle est toujours la plupart de ma cœur. Y'all, I'm like so happy to be here. I'm also just like trying not to cry because like she would be here. That's like the big thing that keeps getting me. I'm like, she would just be chilling, watching everything. <sighs> yes, I'm so glad y'all are here. Um, let me see. So my next announcement, y'all. I am teaching yoga classes every Sunday and I wanna invite you. <laughs> My class is called Grow and Flow, and it's a Sunday class, and I, I really love that it's just like about unwinding. It's not about flexibility. It's not about getting a sweat. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's about dropping into your body. It's about breathing. It's just, yeah. So I just dropped the link in the chat. Come do some yoga with me. Uh, Black to Yoga is this really incredible group of Black yoga instructors who have been um, really just shifting the way that I thought about yoga and the ways that I've seen Black folks in Oakland and the Bay Area and essentially all over now because they're the virtual. Um, just really a, a healing space. Um, yes, Adrian. Adrian's been to my class. Um, so just want to tell y'all, come, come do some yoga. Okay. El algo iris mi corazón no necesita una razón. Sin duda y miedo, yo sé lo que espero. Como agua, son tra soy tranquila y poderosa. Lo que pienso viene aquí. Mis sueños pasan enfrente de mí. Con un voz más fuerte que algún grito. Gracias y amor a mis corazones. Aquí en el tierra, 
y el cielo. The rainbow of my heart waves with gratitude, a journey within and without, releasing every single fear and doubt, not allowing my anxious energy to disrupt my flow. This is the art of letting go of who I've been or had to be. My soul is being set free, letting, letting me know that this place is my home, free to play and laugh and roam, rejoicing at the colors converging from light to dark. Once I understand the situation, I'll defy every spatial limitation, sending love and light to all the dark spaces, filling my heart with familiar faces. I am bountiful, I am beautiful, I have more than enough. I am more than enough. As it is written, so it shall be. I know Yemen will watch over me. She is the mother of water and I'm the child of sea. The strongest currents will not surpass me. Flowing with every obstacle in my path, I know that pain and struggle will not last. I'm gonna repeat that for all of us. Flowing with every obstacle in my path, I know that pain and struggle will not last. Sin duda y miedo, yo sé lo que espero. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Mm. This is so beautiful. Okay. Let me do a few more pieces and like hear the rest. I'm so excited for this whole lineup. So I'm like, so this is what Daniel, when he was here, he was like, let me just get out the way. I was like, Daniel, you don't do your pieces. Now I'm feeling the same. Like, let me just get out the way. Um, <laughs> but no, we'll get into some things. In Delibil. When a sparrow cries, a soul flies silently into the greenest pastures covered by warm rays beaming. Hummingbirds stand still in observance, in reverence, for the stars that no longer burn with the light that never fades. Generational grief in my bone, hope that phrase, dismembered memory. Unspoken knowing in my hair, we say so much more. Shouting wild, vision blurred, the simulations tilting, artifacts shrill of sacrifice, Cloudy countenance, regret creeps out of your eardrums, steady and resounding, white noise tingles straight to the temporal lobe. I help you sing, I help you dance. Les chansons de joie et d'amour profond, pas de souci, pas de larmes, rien qu'une souris qui allume. J'espère que tu vas bien, même si vous savez pas comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my last piece, y'all. And I'm gonna say a little bit about it before. So it's called Black Girl Soldier. And oh my God, all these people that are here. Oh, okay, I'm not gonna cry right now. Um, I'll cry after. It's fine. <laughs> I'm like, it's fine. Um, you know, I wrote this piece just in honor of of a lot of people, of, of myself, of, you know, so I mentioned like my, our inner child, our, just the young people around us, the, the versions, I mean, there's so much, there's so much healing that needs to happen, right? And so um, mainly thinking about Black women, Black women and mental health um, and the space that we really don't have, people don't show us that, you know, Black women hold so much for other people that when we need support, even when we beg for support, it's 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 not given and then folks ask well, why didn't you ask i asked <laughs> and so i just want to continue to amplify this this space of of really listening of when you ask someone how what kind of support they need and they tell you go with that if they don't know don't impose anything on them uh yeah i just really I had to soapbox for a second because I don't think we we sit with that enough. I think people say protect black women. I think people say, you know, I love black women, but you don't listen. <laughs> you don't listen. So really listen, practice some active listening. Listen where you don't have to think about what you're about to say. 
All right. Our first general was underground. Railroads couldn't compare to the depths of her mind on a mission with a vision, precision in the darkest cave covered by branches, isolated by shame no matter where we go, the darkest storms, uprooted black bodies. We continue to hide how we feel inside, not equal, not well, what is being. The blood that drops, my heart that stops beating, emotions and strength from this black vessel, gasping for air, craving help, someone to care, anyone to see that you are not invincible. Sold in condition, hanging on by a noose with no room to break loose in the labels you didn't ask for. Martyr complex, struggling to catch your breath under waters of expectation. Bury your pain to survive. I can't really. Nuclear fractures, familial disasters, armed with silence, surrounded by never ending violence. Haven't we had enough? Faking like we're fine, struggling in pride. Lynchings ruled as suicide, told to hide our wounds inside. Self inflicted crimes, the deepest roots. Admiral abolitionist writer. Wells of information filled her books on a crusade for justice, fighting to resist before a balled up fist. Truth of liberation, asphyxiation. We are the seeds of strange fruit, lemon trees in the summer breeze hemorrhaging from the root. Under leaves of ignorance, our minds assassinated, our souls kidnapped. Our bodies raped. There is no escape from the scars, this skin. When can we begin to heal, to feel, to just be free in the cage where birds wish to sing? Harriet, Ida, Billy, Nina, shape-shifting trauma into triumph. Gardenias bloom across the street. Cope or heal. Ultimately, it's all about how you deal. The deepest roots hold the darkest storms. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Moat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ali, for that incredible feature for your storytelling, for your writing, for bringing your ancestors into this space. Thank you so much for all that you've shared. And I appreciate also all your announcements because I usually ask folks if there's other ways people can support at the end. Um, so I appreciate you dropping those links. Uh, if you do have any other events or other things that you want to shout out now, um, you're totally welcome to. We would love to have everyone know how to keep engaging with your work. Um, I'll drop my website and my website should have everything on it. Listen to my podcast. If you don't, um, like Nia said earlier, it's called chit chat with Alley cat. I have a few folks who have been guests on here on the podcast. So that's really cool. Um, like Melani. Um, so yeah, just tap in all of my things are on the website from my email to my Instagram. So yeah. Thank Amazing. Thank you so much, Ali and everyone, please go follow Ali. Keep up, stay supporting. All right, so we have a few more readers for our second half, and I would like to invite up S.K. Williams to start us off. Welcome. Thank you. And wow, uh, to follow all that, I felt like I was, um, I was uh, seeing paintings and listening to prayers. Thank you for your poetry and all those beautiful um, words about women, especially Black women. I really, really do appreciate that. Ah, thank you so much. Um, wow. I have two pieces and um, the first one is, uh, again, you know, poem about, about um, our collective struggle as people of African descent. And um, I'm a Garifuna woman. I always say that when I read here. Um, and this piece is uh, 
about, no, well, it's not about my people, but it's about our, our ancestors. And this first piece is called, I am a dusky daughter of Latin America. I'm a dusky daughter of Latin America by way of Africa. Until now, not certain which of the 54 nations can claim me. I am the descendant of Africans taken, kidnapped, Barua. I'm a Garifuna woman, a descendant of warriors, with blood of rebellion in my veins. No, I'm not a mestizo or a Creole, not in the strict senses of the words anyway. Those words imply mixture and makes me believe that one has conquered the other, which for me means that our captors have won because they forced us together like they forced themselves on us and into us to create a whole new race by force. No, I am individually African and I'm individually indigenous. Arawak and Carib from the Eastern Caribbean, Antilles, South America, Brazil. It's as far as I know. As for the African, they were warriors and they fought long and hard like hell because they knew in their bones in their blood and in their hearts that they were subjects of no one, least of all those of the pale skin from the north. So they rebelled and survived, allowing me to be free and to say to this day proudly that I am the descendant of Africans who fought like hell for their freedom and survival and for mine. So I can hold up my head and proudly bear witness, standing on their shoulders to their resilience and grit to keep them on their road of self-determination that produced the me that is me, fierce and black and proud. So I say it over and over again and aloud. I am a proud and dusky daughter of Latin America, descendant of the African and the indigenous who fought like hell to be free who upon that shore of Yurume, when those ships ran aground, shook off those manacles like a bad dream, escaping their captors, making me free the way I was supposed to be. That keeps me on my road to redemption. Thank you, that's the first one. My second piece is a love poem. And um, it's an excerpt of, a, of quite a long poem called Contemplating an Orchid. I wrote this just a couple of days ago. And uh, it's meant to be a song, actually. I'm not gonna sing, I'm not a singer. Um, a quiet, silent, sunny Sunday, full of pink orchids, the smell of fresh coffee, and the image of you dangling on the outskirts of my imagination. My day is silent and sunny without you, empty, though full of busyness. My bed is a mess of tangled sheets and pillows smelling of you. Your heartbeat still fills my ears. Your body that barely fits its narrowness has left its diagonal imprint, and I'm pendulous on the edge. Seeing you and the sea, between the pale blue and the green, and your beautiful musical hands, and their gentleness caressing the strings. And me, maybe? Wondering about you and the rain. Will you come back? Will you come back? Will either of you come back? It is the question on the periphery of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much for both of those pieces. Those are really lovely. Next up, I would like to invite Robert and Zachary up to the mic. Welcome. Thank you. I have a poem taken from uh, the 40 Days of Weeping and it, I had spoken with Nia about this poem, and I can tell you I have made it a little short. 13 and 26 day of weeping, Rihanna Taylor, our Mona Lisa. There exists a story I wrote about you, Brianna, a sequence after your untimely and most ungodly death death by tyrants, their hands of employed tyrants. We wanted to write a colorful beauty poem to you and for you, cause you be our Mona Lisa now, 
you and our many other black women gone through days, uncivilized, savage ways from people who's always claimed to be the one so civilized over everybody else. The universe now elevates your place, your high place to the Mona Lisa from the past, now to the story. The setting was a time in the third grade at South Highland School and a picture of this strange fat jaw woman that we knew not as children. There upon getting the nerve as children to ask our beautiful teacher who the person be in the picture. Mona Lisa, she explained, known as the most beautiful woman in the world, known as the most beautiful woman in the world. At that moment, this little third grader in me just lost it. Raising a hand, utterance of truth flowed from my insides. Teacher Crawford, not possible, I said. My mother, aunts, and five sisters all looks better. And Miss Crawford, you too more beautiful than this lady in the picture. How can this be? Even then, me, we as students carving out a rightful place toward you, our Brianna and others who died at the hands of inhumane no names because the smile you left us make us bow to your enduring essence, encoded among smiles of other endearing black queens gone forth in similar uncanny incidents as yours. We weep, we moan, even before this these days, along the lines we realize they played with distorted stories of our true Mona Lisa, we took upon ourselves to name and rename, beginning before beyond with Nefertiti, not knowing then that you would set in her seat amongst the most refined, beautiful woman from us and the world. Unbeknownst to me while in Europe, Europe three times, never desiring to venture into the Louvre to behold this painting of an untrue tale. Then March, 2020, on the 13th day, you Brianna acquired the status of a divine African ancestral queen, the most most beautiful renowned woman in the world, martyred so senseless and brutally, your life taken from us unfinished forever. You became our most beautiful radiant smile of face inward divinely before us. After weeping for many days, I sat and began a poem from Isis and beyond to Nefertiti and Zinga and Candace, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, beholding Rihanna on the 13th day of weeping, arrayed in your divine beauty from birth. Yet here with us only for a little while, your beauty, Brianna was the beauty I saw in the third grade as we children defended your place then, the place of all black women on this sojourn. You and the Natashas and the Michelles and the Dominiques and the Riyads were and still be our sovereign essence Without you all, there shines no buttons 
on endless cul-de-sacs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for that beautiful tribute and, and for sharing that in this space. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Andrea Jacobo. Welcome. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. It's been so long that I have been on um, the open mics and it's such, Ali and all the other poets that have spoken, my heart is so full. Um, I have two poems to share. Um, and they are a little different from one another. I just recently wrote them, so they're still developing, um, as all my poems. <laughs> uh, track two, Essence. To be greeted by a waterfall after a solo hike, to the roads that were once made of dust and gold, Self-discovery under the canopy where the leaves speak of languages that were once familiar to the codes of my dreams. Used to dance to and coupled with desire to flow in the oceans, I learned to swim but not drown, to tread but not lightly because ties that rip wait for no one, like dinner parties that are not meant for chocolate, brown sugar, caramel, light bright, Dulce de leche, snack peas salted, tasting the mango it needed. Words out, sharp, gilet, malchete, rushing through the thoughts of not belonging and hearing the screams from the tree of the trunks shaking. You are what we need. Hummingbird, taste the nectar, the sweetest. Brown girl, morena, java, taste the pinot noir. Let the colors do a dile que no with your taste buds, resistance to the archaic, liberation, aquí, in the future, where melanin can greet waterfalls as, that run their rivers towards them. Love will flow to you. It will flow through you. Solitaire dinner, go to your room following the path you created, cocoon, sleeping into slump, slipping into slumber, dreamer, rocking chairs, melodies, Weed. You can spend as much time at the table when the wine is yours to keep. With the desire to speak leisure without guilt, con el deseo so deep that one day all my folks can taste the lamb cooked in reparations, nourishing the lands where waterfalls dream of our feet touching their mossed petals. Cast the stone within, let it rip, ripple, and wait for no one to save you for you are the one you've been looking for. Levántate, mi niña. You will rise again. Essence trails ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. I spent some time in nature and I was just consumed by it this past few days. Thank you so much. Um, the second one is a little, I'm trying something new. So I'm, a, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive. So this is the first time you're doing this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just testing the waters. <clears throat> Tell me what you want from me. Take a look within you see. Let me know that universe is right here riding all your fears. Yo quiero un hombre bien bueno. From within that light, radiates on his cocoa butter skin, reflecting the abundance of Mother Earth, respecting the divine feminine, embodying the universal rule, que rueda el abismo del amor eterno. I want a love so patient and deep, like the ways they will look at me when I walk in the door. Tell me what you want from me. Take a look within you see. Let me know that you know the Earth is right here riding all by me. A man that loves kids as much as I do, works towards a better today and even better tomorrow. Mañana con un poco de mango con huevo to fuel our love of dancing the rhythms of our ancestors, gifted us in art, music, and culture. Tell me what you want from me. 
take a look within you see let me know that universe is right here riding all your needs i want people to experience love so deep warmth and it's built from the spark of our core's mantle the mantle in which we lay our heads to cool and speak our truth tell me what you want from me take a look within you see let me know that universe is writing here writing all our needs thank you wow thank you oh it was so good to hear your poetry again and i love the new experiments bringing music and poetry together that was wonderful thank you so much Next up, I would like to invite Renata Pavri. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So uh, I'm joining you from Mumbai in India. So it's like early morning here. And this is my first time at Open Mic. So uh, I have joined book club discussions with Moat. So that's how I got to know about this. So I've written a, a piece about the sea because uh, Growing up in Mumbai, the coastline is right here and the sea is always around. So it's called Sponge of Stories. I find the shoreline fascinating, walking along the edge where land meets water, dogs chasing waves, crabs crawling in and out of burrows, starfish and seaweed, then from sea to shore. The ocean sees, feels, and knows it all. Footprints, paw prints, claw prints, imprinted in grains of sand. All species revealing their plans, lost to the tides of time. Stories that the sea makes her own, life journeys soaked up by words. In the stillness and comfort of low tide, fury and fervor of high tide, La Mer watches us, her waves beckon to karma turmoil. One can never be lonely in the solitude of the sea. Soft sand crunching beneath my feet tells my story to the welcoming water, carries it upon bouncing waves, a deep blue that keeps away the blues. There's nothing like a walk on the beach to calm a raging mind and energize a lethargic one. The sea washes away my stories and turns me into a storyteller. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that poem and for being up in the early morning to join us here. It was really wonderful. Uh, next up, I would like to invite Janae Newsom up to the mic. Welcome. Hi, thank you guys um, so much for having me. Super happy to be here. Um, all of the poetry and stories have been super amazing. Also, Allie Jones. <laughs> Allie Jones. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and read. I was like trying to go back and forth between what I would read, but I, I guess I'll just read this piece called um, These Bullets Have All of Our Names. Um, I wrote this in April. It was just me talking, but then I realized that it's kind of a poem. Um, so I'll go ahead and read it. <laughs> uh, this is called These Bullets Have All of Our Names. I grew up hearing the phrase, bullets don't got no names. My girl used to say it to us when we'd be playing out in the street and shots rang out. Or my mama would say it if we happened to be watching the news and heard about another somebody being killed because they were caught in the crossfire. We knew to drop to the ground or climb into a tub. We knew a bullet could come for any one of us because that's what bullets do. They find a target. There are only a few things in life I can be sure of. And one of them is most police officers killing black folks probably never grew up dodging bullets, never grew up with black skin and whether in the hood or the suburbs, blackness is a crime that we pay for with our lives. Often when I hear this phrase, it was related to youngsters carrying guns that they didn't even know how to use, thus bullets spraying all over the place, hitting people and things they weren't meant for. Somehow, even though a bullet is a bullet, Whenever I heard the phrase, I never conceived that a cop's bullet had no name. I knew it wore the names of my people from the very beginning. This ain't because I read it in history books, slave patrols and all. It's because I seen it with my own eyes. Police ripping through folks' houses with warrants, emptying dressers, flipping beds and leaving the mess they made. The way they raise their voices and lack patience 
treat you as if you have no ownership over your own body. Police think they own black folks. To be a mother and be on the other end of a phone while talking to your son who was terrified because the police are at his car and to hear your son's murderers telling him to hang up the phone then to call and call and call until finally a voice answers the phone and it is not your son's and then your heart sinks. You feel it deep in your bones. They have taken him from you like black children sold at auction, like strange fruit dangling in quiet, lonely air. Then everywhere you look, folks in America's favorite uniform say it was an accident. He had a name, a life and breath in his body until folks who we pay took his life. The people's money has blood on its hands. It's dealing in murder and genocide. When will it be unacceptable for police to take our lives? When will it be unjustified? When the system burns to the ground, when every fiber of this unjust system crumbles into the soil of this stolen land, along with its forefathers, we abide by a constitution that was created by thieves. What is progress without ab abolishing the entire system? Why do police who murder get a slap on the wrist when they take off that uniform? Are they not human? This country can never make up for all of the lives it has taken. Babies sent back to their essence too soon. Young men celebrating the new year, walking back from the store, walking away with hands in the air, playing with a toy, selling cigarettes, standing in their own home, driving in their car with a baby in the backseat and a girl in the front with a license to carry, going for a jog, being mentally ill in Walmart. Black women get killed and go missing, slaughtered in their sleep, in their homes, playing video games, crying pregnant, mysterious happenings in jail cells. These bullets carry carry our names everywhere and anywhere at any time and any place. Thank you. Wow, that was, that was incredible. Thank you for that piece, for bringing all that to, that, to this space. Thank you. So Avancha is the next person that's up in our lineup. And I know she said in the beginning, she was double booked. She had a feature somewhere else and was gonna hop out and then hop back in. Um, so we're gonna give her just a couple minutes to see if she's gonna rejoin us. But in the meantime, we're gonna do a mini encore and have Ali read one more piece for us. So thank you, Ali. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Danae. That was beautiful. I was like, whew. Yes. Wow. Everyone has been so incredible tonight. Like I'm just like truly blown away and honored. Um, really honored to be here to be featuring tonight. I'm going to share another piece from the novel. This is a, a dream sequence. It's a little different. I just want y'all to know. So you're like, where we go, Ali? La vie en rose est une rêve. Once you look, you will see. Beyond the walls, within the trees, all that you know, feel, see. La vie en rose est une rêve. A brilliant crescent moon lit a mysterious being who stood on a marble platform between two columns, one onyx, the other ivory. Each column was covered in symbols and gold adornment in a garden that resembled a terrarium full of sand, succulents, and moss. A plump crow motions its head back and forth through the gravel like a living arrow. Ave spotted the hooded figure in an indigo cape knee-high black boots and an elaborate pearl headpiece. A thin pink veil covered in pomegranates was held up by the pristine columns. Ave looked around and noticed tea-stained scrolls in the figure's hand. She knew that hand. Ave walked towards that familiar frame. It couldn't be. At a quick glance, she thought it was her aunt, Callista, the same aunt who had died in a way her family refuses to talk about. Nana G says she was sick. Ave's mom stays silent. Silver rings reflected in the moonlight up to her face. She rubbed her eyes and looked again. Across the dewy garden, her aunt motioned her to come closer. When she approached the figure, she realized it was her aunt Callie. The moss rapidly started to grow on the steel rod bench, then all over the ground. Then she looked down at her feet as it was coming up her feet. Ave realized she was walking in the moss in a body of water. Without overthinking, she quickly ran to the platform. The singing rose to a crescendo and she could decipher what was being said. La vie en rose est une rêve. 
Auntie Kelly, what are you doing out here? Ave said. Once you look, you will see, she said. The shimmering arc moved towards their feet. She looked past Ave and smirked. Something was wrong. The warm oasis grew cold. Her eyes were hollow and frigid, colder than the oldest ice box, a piercing trill that shook the atmosphere. The image of Callista shattered, each piece louder than the last. Crackling turned to muffled screaming. Glass pieces melted right into the pond. Ave could hear footsteps sloshing on wet leaves in the grass. Someone started gliding towards her in a matching cape. Ave shook her head and started to run in the opposite direction. The leaves vanished from the oak tree, then turned upside down, then right side up. The ground began to shake and the pomegranates began to fall off the veil one by one. They rolled towards Ave with haste. Fractured pomegranates spilled out liters of juice covering the mossy gravel before she could get really far. A plant appeared at her feet and began to grow. Within seconds, the bud became a tree. Ave carefully sat elevated in the branches. Without warning, the silent crow let out a screech that vibrated the branches of the tree. The tree bark opened up and swallowed Ave whole. Words echoed down the trunk into her ears. Beyond the walls within the trees, all that you know, feel, see. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Ali. That was, that was wonderful. I appreciate you doing this mini encore. Um, Abacha has not joined us. <laughs> I was hoping she'd be able to, to come back after her other feature, but who knows? <laughs> so I'm definitely gonna invite her to kick off our next open mic, um, which is a good transition because I invite you all to join us for our next open mic. This is an ongoing series that happens every two weeks. And so our next one will be on August 5th. And we have the wonderful Reina de Leon as our feature. Reina has been hugely involved with Moad. She was one of our inaugural poets in residence here. And so we're very excited to have her back um, in the space as an open mic feature. Um, that being said, we also have many other programs that are coming up. So please do visit uh, our website, which is moadsf.org to check out all of our other programming. Um, in the open mic kind of notes and heads up, please do save the date for August 19th as well. Um, this will be our first outside program, which is new, <laughs> but we're going to be celebrating um, the now over three years of this open mic series and bringing back some of our past features to all do a group reading together. So it is not the entirety of all our features because there's so many, but we're gonna keep doing more events to showcase um, all of our features, but we have a wonderful lineup of readers. Um, and I think we have that information in the chat as well. So it's gonna be in the Yerba Buena Gardens. So in San Francisco, if you are able to come and join, it'll be outside. Um, and so it'll be really wonderful for, to see some people in person and to continue this space um, in a physical presence as well. Um, so I invite you all to attend that. Well, that actually, <laughs> I know I just thought that. So, I will pause my announcements and hope that you all stay so that we can hear Avacha do her pieces. Um, but do save those dates <laughs> and I'll, I'll wrap up the announcements following um, Avacha's reading. Uh, welcome back. Um, oh. We wanted to invite you back up. Um, we well, were grateful. I'm waiting. sorry I had to miss any part of it because it's always <laughs> so wonderful. But anyway, I'm here. Um, my book, uh, with every step I take, is coming out of second printing, and there'll be a few new things in it. Uh, and I'm very honored to that it's sold out. I hear there's a couple of secondhand things over on the Amazon, but it's going to be reprinted, and it should be out pretty soon with a couple of extra things. And it's called Global African Jazz Dance. It's a jolly thing, jolly, D-J-A-L-I, for the historical storytellers uh in africa and since i am now my grandsons are now also performing artists that makes five generations of performing artists in my family so anyway so this is about me and them and all the rest of those folks i am poetry's musical child a born again sound freak i have always been here and i will always be here 
And this time, like all the other times, was no accident. Someone somewhere in the bush wished me into existence. My coming was written in a field by some no writing ancestor, an ancestor who was always watching and noticed every single time old master wasn't looking and took a break from being broken. An ancestor was brave enough and defiant enough to risk their life and sing and dance and pray me into existence. I am the prize. The result of all their desperation, their trials and tribulations, I am the product of all those lives lived in whispers. The dreams they died for, the wish they couldn't speak of as me, a girl child, called into being by, I called into being as much by necessity as by love and set free by all the unseen tears of too many brothers left hanging from too many trees. Too mad to be sad, the ancestors just spit me out and I was back in the mix. I say I was back in the mix, choice, hmm. I had no say. I was given a job to do when I landed on the road where Howlin' Wolf, Sun Ra, Celia Cruz, Coral's Pairs and Dance. And they left me in the care of two flamboyant, very flamboyant, serious dances. And the air I grew up in was completely saturated with the sweaty, graceful beauty of their art, the sexually explicit, erratic power of their syncopation, the inescapable hypnotic centuries, old gyrations, a harmonic signature of a long ago time, time when the spirit of poetry first put its musical spell on me. Mine is a timeless, jolly destiny. And there's no way to escape it. I even bleed in A minor and I dream in 13th and long before I was born, music took control of my soul. I never needed or wanted any of those corny nursery rhymes of rhythmic 6-8 clave, all the tunjes, uh, Yoruba chants for peace, Art Blakey's drums and passion, called in the supernatural voice of Sabu. It was Sabu Martinez who sang my liberation dance and I fell asleep listening to the trees breathe. The sound of nightfall is my lullaby and the nighttime is always my right time. And the complex sensual simplicity of a Shirley Horn song will always make my soul sing. And Big Mama Thornton, sister was like a triple dose of 11 uh, adrenaline. Cab, Cab Calloway, the spirit man of swing, forced me to hear with my eyes and pure spiritual integrity of Mongo Santa Maria left me breathless. His gift, a Latin symphony, a mystical exercise you could dance uh, to, left me so naturally high I had to laugh and cry. He made me want to sing. Their music is my medicine, a melodic, phonic, tonic, jazz, one of those can't live without keys, a key that helps to set me free, down at the crossroads where it all comes together, there's a party going on and it's calling out to me, calling out my name for the music and poetry scene. And there's no way to escape it. I said, there's no way to escape it. Like the blues, one more sacred cosmic tool of fertilizer, creating art stronger than time, a power that makes me whole, complete, stronger than all the pain of chopping cane and unrelenting heat, unrelenting heat, a sanctified sad, a sweet and mellow, bassy tune, a feel holler, a scream. And I even dream in A minor, and I bleed in 18th and 13th and any other kind of key. That's the first part of the poem. It's a very long poem, so I only did a piece of it. Forgive me for editing while I'm reading, which gets kind of confusing, but thank you for listening to my words. And support Moad. You guys are opening, folks. They're opening, and I know they got a whole, whole bunch of things there. So, folks, you need to support them and check them out in this beautiful building. I'm so grateful you guys are reopening. Thank you so much, Abacha, both for your poetry and for always shouting us out. We did just announce this week we will be re reopening to the public on October 21st. So I invite all of you to come and check out our new exhibits, and we have information in the chat as well, so you can learn about all the exhibits that will be on view. So many things to save the date for, um, but we'll keep doing these events. Um, my last uh, announcement is that if you can continue to support the museum, we do appreciate that. Uh, if you are able to financially donate, we accept donations through our website, as well as via phone by texting the number 56512 and typing in Moed SF. And there's quick directions on how to give and support MOAD. So we really appreciate that in addition to your attendance and your participation. Um, so please do keep showing up. Uh, if you do have a couple of seconds to fill out our program survey that we just put in the chat and on the QR code, we would love to get your feedback. Um, any experience um, from our programming that you wanna share, we do appreciate that. And with that, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care.